I'll also thank uh, Invest Northern Ireland for uh, being sufficiently um, advanced thinking to think that, uh, that there is something in this technology that might actually benefit the economy. Because all, all too often these days it's very tempting for people to say this electronic stuff is all done, the game is played and we've lost. Now actually the truth is far from that. The game is played but what we're doing is largely invisible because it's complicated but actually we're in a pretty good position we're winning and I hope to explain why um, <clears throat> although people will, will talk about various terms you won't hear too many people talking about electronic systems but I'm going to because most people have an idea what an electronic system is uh, others under, other terms you might hear are systems, IT, ICT, technology these are all kind of misleading terms and the thing about electronic systems is you can see them all around you. These are the gadgets that we know and love. They're the, the printers, the cameras, the tellies, the iPhones, the washing machines. They're everywhere and these visible ones which are everywhere become important to you. Uh, they're important but they're not vital. You know if, if you didn't have your digital camera the world wouldn't end. Uh, it might be inconvenient and if you didn't have your, di your digital phone generally speaking you could manage with a wired phone the world did actually go for quite a long time without having uh, wireless phones uh, <clears throat> so it's a very personal thing and it's very greatly valued what you tend not to be aware of though are the electronic systems which are built into the infrastructure these are the ones which are everywhere else um, I don't suppose many people uh, benefit from the congestion charge up here in Belfast but uh, the Londoners all love this one and that of course is enabled uh, by the same technology that enables uh, the police to spot your uh, car number plate as you go past a little bit faster than you should do but everywhere around in medical, in uh, finance, in travel um, you've got uh, radar, you've got the identity, satellite communications the cup of tea is significant because actually this, this relates to logistics. Uh, actually a cup of tea is one of those very difficult things to do because you've got the materials associated with the cup, you've got the water and the availability of the purity, you also have the growing and the shipping of the tea and of course making it available as something which is so cheap and so available that most people don't even think about it. And then of course there's cars. You don't think of your car as being a technology device, it's a vehicle to move you from A to B but increasingly it's navigating for you, it's compensating for the road conditions uh, and it's protecting you in the event of somebody else having an accident in front of you because of course it's never you that actually makes the, uh, the errors in such cases. These however are becoming more significant because these are vital and they're vital not just to you but to the economy. More and more we are dependent on these electronic systems, they're everywhere and so it's about uh, time that we were aware that not only are these a little bit inconvenient if they were to cease to exist but actually they would bring down the economy uh, in a bigger way than the banks would incidentally now there's some numbers here um, and of course computing everybody is familiar with a computer is a thing that sits on your desk uh, it's a word processing machine um, maybe you have a computer which is at the bank which is looking after your, uh, your finance but actually increasingly you're carrying around a computer in your pocket. Um, it's not a computer because people want to be clever it's just a way of making those machines which are actually fairly complex machines and software is a way of handling complexity which works quite well for describing operations which are built in systems. So not surprisingly back in 1960, and there is a little red dot if you look very hard, there was only a few machines um, in the, basically in any economy. Large machines were big expensive things to carry around with you. These days we're carrying around really sophisticated computation machines in our pocket but the other thing that's noticeable is the, the units which have gone to a million worldwide to a hundred billion worldwide means that the vast majority of computers that are actually in the world today are not like the ones which are on your desk, not like the ones which are in the banks they're like the ones which are in your pocket you don't see and the ones which are in the speeding machines which you don't see it's time to understand this 
we, have to, we need to understand where they come from. We need to understand the business opportunities that exist within them. And we also need to minimize the vulnerability to globalization. These products, as I will tell in a moment, are the result of global activities. And we are doing our part in that. If we are negligent and assume that these are simply going to be provided by somebody out there and we'll just be able to buy them from the shelves of PC World or the equivalent, then we're due for a very large mistake because our economy will be dependent on them and the supply will be that uh, equivalent to buying gas or oil from, uh, from a, com a country that doesn't particularly love us anymore. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to start to do some uh, delving into this magic, which is technology, because electronics is a wonderful thing. Um, it's what I've spent my life doing. I'm a technologist, primarily, which is why I feel uncomfortable in a suit. It is the pinnacle, undoubtedly the pinnacle, of human achievement. It's enabled us to do such wonderful things, which I think is, is really hard to say that this is other than magic. Why? How else could I take this stone and take the atoms apart and make it into this phone? That's a pretty clever thing to do, wouldn't you think? Is it clever or is it magic? Well, thanks to standing on the shoulders of giants, we are, of course, learning from the people who've gone before us, from the engineers and the scientists who've told us how to do things, and based on what they've told us how to do, we carry forward and establish a new platform a little bit higher, and then other engineers and scientists will, be will base their work on that platform and take it yet higher. So we have this ability to do it, but it's not magic. Now I want to define the difference here between magic and, uh, and science, because magic is what Harry Potter does. He gets a stick, breaks it in an appropriate length, says a magic word, and something happens. We don't convert the stone into a phone by magic. We convert it by laboriously taking the stone apart, atom by atom, then re-establishing, rebuilding it, reconfiguring it into a phone. There's a difference between magic and, uh, uh, and science, and that is science is work. Magic is just happening. Now the problem is that any sufficiently advanced technology, thanks to Arthur C. Clarke, is indistinguishable from magic. So I can't expect you, if you're, a sci if you're not a scientist, to understand uh, automatically that there is a difference between um, growing a plant and making a foam. So these don't grow on trees, you've probably noticed that, they're pretty cheap but they don't grow on trees. Um, and we don't know how things grow on trees, no matter who the scientist is, no matter what they tell you about what we know about life and uh, genetic codes and things of that nature and chemistry, there's no way, no scientist in the world today can, take a, uh, can make an oak tree without an acorn. And yet pretty well everybody can make an oak tree with an acorn. So you don't need a science degree, or be a professor or a doctorate or anything else to do certain things. But there is a danger that we become known as magicians because we do magic. And that danger is, uh, is particularly tricky because it trivializes what we do. And in trivializing it in what we do, then the, the, the major concern is it puts our society, our economy at risk because it says that what we do isn't important. Now, back in 2011, the uh, uh, what's the organization called? It says at the bottom of my slide, but it's just drifted off the bottom. Um, Engineering UK did a survey. This is a, a group that uh, is a government-sponsored activity to report on engineering in the UK altogether. And they, uh, they did this survey, a public perception of engineers, and they said, when surveyed, 92% of men, 84% of women said they thought that engineering would play an important role in tackling climate change. Good. Uh, that means society understands what engineers are, going, uh, are involved in, doesn't it? But that was the worrying part that followed on. However, when asked what engineering developments in the last 50 years had had significant impact on their lives, 52% and 71% of women couldn't name one. That's like 60 odd percent of people couldn't think of anything that engineers had done in the last 50 years which had impacted their lives. Well, it was beyond people's understanding. 
this is the problem. It's, uh, they don't see the engineering that's around them. So I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, track back in history, so bear with me for a moment. This is what life would be like without engineering, and it would still be like this today. For 3,000, 3,500 years, this is what science and technology looked like. What was good for my father's 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 father is good enough for me. Didn't move on very much. We were heavily outnumbered. Population of the world, 100,000 um, to around a million. Growth rate, 0.1% per annum. Actually, still about the same birth rate, but a hell of a lot of people were dying. Uh, life expectancy, 34 years. Mission just to survive. I'm going to go back a little bit further now because I've started on the thread and I like it. Um, I mean, just to tell you really how long some of these things take. Um, Cro-Magnon man, we are all Cro-Magnon man. We came out 35,000 years ago from the Homo sapiens and for most of the 35,000 years that followed we didn't do anything. We just carried on living like, like I've described before. But the philosophers appeared 2,500 years ago and they, are, they had as a mission, if you like, to understand nature they started to realize that when you bang stones together that it hurt when your fingers were in between them. But they also started to notice that things like water became steam when you boiled it and things like that. The scientists started to manipulate that a few thousand years later. By, so by the time we're talking a thousand years ago, we have Descartes and we have the first mentions of electricity. And these guys are starting to manipulate nature. What, what can we do with steam? It's still not a product, incidentally. This is just a philosophy. Steam is interesting, things happen. The Galileo steam engine, which is a, a sphere with water in it and two little jets, goes round and round. How novel. The engineers didn't appear until just 260 years ago. It's called the Industrial Revolution. For those of you who are historians, and for most, mostly when I talk to an audience of engineers, I have to explain it to them because most of them don't understand what history is. They were out, or they were doing physics or science or maths at the time. Uh, history is not terribly interesting, but actually, as our speaker earlier said today, uh, history is very interesting, actually. But just 260 years ago, just eight generations ago, we had the Industrial Revolution. And it was the exploitation of nature that came along with this. Exploitation of nature means taking advantage of what we know. It produced an economic and a population explosion, and we've never stopped. It unleashed the power of science by delivering it in ways that satisfied a volume need. Single-handedly, the Industrial Revolution created money and, co and consumers, which never existed before either. There was small amounts of money in circulation for large things, but basically everything was done before on an exchange basis. It actually did begin in the UK and it did spread through to the rest of the world. And it was mechanization of texture, textiles, iron making, transportation, steam power, water wheels, power machinery, profound effect on, on socio-economical and cultural conditions. But for the first time in human history, 35,000 years, the living standards of the masses of ordinary people underwent sustainable growth. Then we come to the more recent times. And these are my times. 1940 was the first real electronic product. It's the exploitation of the atom. Now atoms, we know they're pretty small things. Uh, it's difficult to get your head around just how small they are, incidentally, but they're pretty small. They're in there. We've, we've, we've read the textbooks and we were at those lessons in school at one stage and they all talked about atoms, but actually manipulating them is way exciting. Uh, and 1940 was the first technologies, valves. When I actually moved into the electronics business as an apprentice, valves was the technology I was working on. Fairly quickly, 1947, the first transistor had been born. And now we're talking about the integrated transistor, of which there are many thousands, millions, on an integrated circuit. The pace of that growth has been phenomenal, and yet it's all happened within the last 70 years. It's not. 70 years and there was something exciting before that. It was 35,000 years in which not much happened and then the 70 years when I happened to fall on my feet and you have as well, when this really exciting technology has come to a life, to, a, to its pinnacle. Now in this area there's this thing called Moore's Law. It was a, a guy called Gordon Moore 
uh, who was one of the founders of Intel, who proposed this back in 1970, no, 1965. He was dealing with the very first integrated circuits and he had noticed that the number of transistors that he was putting on an integrated circuit was doubling roughly every two years. Uh, incidentally, when he made that observation, the number of transistors on a circuit was eight and he was building a circuit which had 16 on it. So it was a pretty far-fetched uh, elaboration that he was able to draw, but that, that equation has been continuing. There is no fundamental physical reason why it should continue, except it has, and it's continued to this day. It does mean that when ARM came into existence, and I'll come and talk a little bit more about ARM in a few minutes, but for the moment just believe it that I work for them, uh, the, the number of transistors that you got onto an integrated circuit was around a million. That's 1991. Today, you go and you buy a memory card from a, a shop corner, you pay three or five pounds for it, and it's got 20,000 million transistors on it. 20,000 million. And it only costs a few pounds. That's, whoops, nearly pressed the wrong button. There's one button here that says I mustn't press, and that's the one I nearly pressed. 20,000 times more functionality on a chip now than when ARM was founded. I want to let that sink in a moment. That's what we've been busy doing. Handling the fact that every two years the number of transistors you put on an integrated circuit is doubled. We have to design that. And why do we have to design it? Because you guys want to buy products which are using that sophistication. You are demanding, you're driving forward all the time. I like the thing I've got, but actually I want it to be smaller, cheaper, faster, better resolution, better quality, all of those things. And every year Moore's Law gives us twice as many transistors and we're able to use those as long as we can put the design teams into place to make it happen. So let's look at the transistor today. A modern transistor is 30 nanometers square. That doesn't mean anything. What's a nanometer? It's very, very, very small. In fact, this diagram at the top shows you how big an atom is in relationship to the size of the transistor. So we know that we're getting down to the lumpy bits. Um, these are, that's another illustration of the same thing, but we know we're getting down to the, the actual bumpy bits in matter itself when we're making these transistors. But to give you some idea of it then in perhaps something which is more of a human context, you could put 3,000 transistors side by side in the thickness of a 10 pound note. Anybody who hasn't got a 10 pound note, a 5 pound note will do just as well. 3,000 side by side. It means that Oh, incidentally, there'll be twice as many in 18 months' time. That's the pace that we're working on. It's not slowing down, it's changing, but it's not slowing down. It also means that, and that's the blow-up of, of the edge of a 10-pound note, or as my son put it, it's a piece of chipboard, Dad. It means that you can put a megabyte, which is the size of the average picture that you take with your smartphone, on a square on the edge of a 10 pound note, which is the same length as it is depth. It's so tiny. It's no wonder you can get so many pictures on a, uh, a two or three gigabyte memory card. This memory has got some, some relationship to the size of the atoms, don't forget. We're getting down there, but that gives you this phenomenal capacity, which is on an integrated circuit. Now I'm gonna talk about this fellow because We've talked about integrated circuits and we're going to sort of start to see how they're used in this. Now, of course, the world is split into, as far as I can see, two groups. Those who've got an iPhone and those who wish they had. Now, actually, I'm just awkward. I haven't got an iPhone. And the reason I haven't got an iPhone, of course, is the iPhone isn't the same shape as a stone. But inside this steel, this steel bound obsidian icon is stuff. Now you'd be led, you might have been misled to believe by the sign on the outside of this that really the clever stuff was done by the Chinese and the Americans. Because it does say, designed by Apple in California, assembled in China. Now, surely that's it, isn't it? I mean, assembly is assembly, it's where the money is made. Design is where the knighthoods are made. So if you're, uh, I can't remember who the guy's name is even, it's not that important to me, but if you want to get a knighthood and work in design, then actually you better be the, the guy who designs the outside, Jonathan Ive, that's the, that's the fella. 
But there's actually much more to the design of this fella than, uh, than meets the eye. It's cool, but it's cool at many levels. Uh, I've drawn the physical shape on the outside of the case, but there's even things like the, the touch sensor screen, the, the graphics capability, the interfaces, but going down inside, and yes, there is an inside. It's hard to imagine how these things have an inside because they don't come apart anymore. But there is an inside. They still don't grow on trees. An iPhone has to be made, step at a time, by lots and lots of people who have experience in specific areas of technology and the robotization of it, and the manufacturing of it, and the distribution of it, lots and lots and lots of skills. Take the eye, the, we've not got really gone very far inside this product before we encounter the vibrator motor. Now it's not, a, it's not an integrated circuit, therefore it's not exciting, and it's not software, therefore it's not exciting. Actually, it's very exciting. You look at that, wrong one. See if it stays. It doesn't. Now it does. You look at that little motor, you think, how do they make it? The robotization necessary to make that little motor, a little, vib a little um, rotating commutator inside there, a little tiny winding, a little tiny magnet, that's quite a technology achievement in its own right. It had to be designed, it had to be manufactured by somebody somewhere. And oh, incidentally, we don't include that in the Chinese or the, uh, or the American. It's a component, from their point of view, component they use. Similarly, the camera. Uh, ever so little, uh, little camera, one centimeter by one centimeter by 0.8 of a centimeter. And yet it's a five megapixel camera with uh, video capabilities and LED for flash and illumination and uh, tap focusing. It's a wonderfully sophisticated piece of kit, but it also had to be designed by somebody. Now inside the modules, and there are more modules inside this, you find there's a little board. If it was a PC, they would describe this thing as the motherboard, and we take the lid off on this motherboard and we find lots of stuff. This is an, an integrated circuit. Here's another one, here's another one, there's some down here another one over there, another one here and there. There's actually 20 integrated circuits in this phone. Anybody gives you the idea that inside an iPhone is a chip, whether it's an ARM chip or anything else like that, they're totally wrong. There's 20 integrated circuits in this thing, significant ones. There is also a whole bunch of small ones, specialist components and capabilities for RF and vibration and uh, uh, the, act, the uh, three axis gyroscopes and the magnetic sensors, all of those are, all have to be provided, they're all in here and somebody has the skills and the knowledge necessary to create it. Now looking at these things you find that uh, ARM, I've listed some things there, ARM partners, even I can't see the dot, but most of these companies are ARM partners, AKM isn't, Texas Instruments is, uh, so all I can say is that it's not disclosed, publicly disclosed, which of these chips have got ARM in them, because uh, Apple doesn't tell, tell information like that, but these are ARM partners who license ARM technology, so chances are that there is ARM technology in this product. Oh, I forgot to mention the uh, invisible components, go back. The uh, software, the tools, the OS's, the drivers, GSM security, graphics, video, sound, the manufacturing of the components, the assemblies, the sub-assemblies, the test certification, lots of technology activities in here because you have to remember these are not created by magic, they're created laboriously, one step at a time, by teams, often thousands of people worldwide working on getting this out. The board has actually got another side on it. And uh, I'll particularly focus on this fellow down here at the bottom, which is the A4 chip. Uh, well, this one we do know has got the ARM product in it. This is the main processor which is inside your, the iPhone. Uh, I said you can see the other ones that are in there, but I'm going to look inside that chip a little bit because taking that little package and cutting it in half sideways on, we can see over here it says there's the processor die, so that's the integrated circuit which is where the the computer is, and then over here you've got two memory chips which are sitting on top of it inside the package. Now that in itself is a wildly exciting technology. How do you make a package like that which incorporates all of those chips is still less than half a millimeter thick and is going to be reliable enough to be used in products which are going to be made in the hundreds of thousands? 
and shipped around the world and never essentially go wrong. A lot of technology in here, Samsung, unknowns. Uh, so again, we don't know which of the, the people that are um, necessarily putting all of the things together which go into this. Now this isn't the same chip as the A4. Apple don't give out pictures of the A4, but here's a very similar chip which is produced by uh, Nvidia. This is the Tegra chip, and if you've got a, um, uh, a one of the other tablets other than Apple, then chances are it's going to be powered by the in, uh, Nvidia Tegra chip. Now, the, the thing that's particularly nice about this one is you can see that there are five lumps in this. You don't really know what they are until you realize that over here, which is a block diagram of the thing, is that you realize that there is five computers in this. Not just one computer, five computers. In fact, there's seven computers in it. There's two of them which you just don't see. They're over here on the left-hand side. They're listed here, GPU and ARM7. So there's seven computers in this one, not five. This is a chip which is, just to put a scale on it, there it is next to some earbuds. And if you go inside it, then you won't be at all surprised to find that when you delve ultimately smaller and deeper, that you have real connecting bits of wire and somewhere down at the bottom here, there's one, a transistor. It really has got three billion of those. Three billion? One billion. One billion, that's a thousand million of those transistors. And there's one of them. Look, there's another one over here. And another one just there. One thousand million of those things, the position of them and how they connect together had to be defined, had to be realized. The design tools to help to make it happen, the uh, training of the engineers, the teaching of the languages, the, uh, the methods to make, it, to, to, to make it possible at all, the skilled technologists, the people who know about the photochemistry, the people, people who know about the chemistry, all had to get together to make that happen. It didn't just happen by mistake or by accident. Now Apple doesn't say, and I've often said, said it so many times already, Apple doesn't say very much about its business, but it does say some useful things when it does. Uh, it was pressurized in uh, 2011 to say something about its supply chain because there was claims that it was being unfair and it wasn't actually giving everybody appropriate level opportunities. And so they listed 159 what they call tier one suppliers. Those are the people who are immediately involved with supplying them technology into their products. 159, thousands of design engineers involved in those, tens of thousands of engineers uh, and globally, not just in America or China or everywhere. And we've not gone into the tier two and the tier three suppliers. And in fact, although we've got 159 suppliers in there, ARM isn't listed. In other words, ARM is a, two, a tier two or a tier th three supplier. So we're, although we're a most significant supplier of technology into their product, we still don't count as a major supplier into their systems. It just gives you an idea of how many people, how many operations, how many businesses, how many activities are really involved in the creation of these things. These things are the children of a global network of technology and know-how businesses. It's much more sophisticated than just the factory. But we've got to look at making money out of technology business. Now, businesses have to be money-making machines. We should stop apologizing for that. Successful businesses make money. Uh, they do it by selling stuff that people want to buy at a price they can afford. So with a business model that makes some sense at a price that they, uh, they want to pay, and actually the quality and the functionality of the thing that you buy is entirely your fault. Um, because businesses sell what you want to buy. Uh, so we mustn't be guilty about that. We're not talking about ideals or society values or anything else like that. We're talking about delivering what you guys are asking for because that's the stuff you're prepared to pay for. And it's you buying stuff off the shelf that ultimately funds all of those thousands of people, all of those enterprises who are involved in the life cycle of those products. It's called life cycle and it's a good word to get used to. Products, and uh, our speaker earlier said this, Products make business by being different, not by being the same. And so we don't want to be perfect. What we need to be is better. Uh, end customers buy functionality, not technology. Unless you're a geek, nobody buys technology for the sake of it. Um, commoditization is undesirable to business. 
because that just means competition on cost, competition on availability, doesn't mean, to, uh, uh, doesn't mean lots and lots of revenue, the margins are tight. Businesses want to have good margins. Now new products are expensive and risky and that is the thing which always has to be borne in mind in this business context because if you're going to make money then you do it not by taking risk but by being smart by using what you know how to do and minimizing the involvement of stuff that you don't know how to do so introducing new technology for example can just increase the cost of something um, it may not increase the functionality it may not give the customer anything extra that they're prepared to pay for but it may actually incur quite a lot of cost or penalty to you in terms of trying to get something out. So any idea of technology being a new product in its own right is, is meaningless. People don't buy technology, people buy products. And new technology just enables options. It enables you to create a, a changed product in some way and some of those changed products will have an enhanced value to your customers, but not all of them. So simply because somebody has a new technology doesn't mean to say it's sensible for you to use it. Uh, on the other hand, it doesn't mean to say that it's not, because a new technology could enable you to significantly differentiate your, your product from the other ones in the market. And differentiation is what it's all about. Just beware of it, really, not to be treated uh, light-heartedly. And the other thing is globalization. Globalization is enabled by not just the internet, it's enabled by containerization, the World Trade Organization, uh, the international contract law, English as a uh, langu langu frinca, oh, default language, English as a lang, I've forgotten the term, langua franca, franca thank you. <laughs> um, and of course then there's the internet and the PC, those are important contributions and the, and the smartphone and the ability to, to network, ICT. Those are important contributions, but they're not the only contributions. They're part of this. One thing that globalization gives you, though, is it gives you competition. You know that. You're already able to um, buy components from somebody in China or Japan or uh, India or the Far East or wherever, or even in Europe, or you could buy them from a supplier down the road. So you know that that supplier down the road is facing competition from all of those other uh, places, but you are unsympathetic because you're in business and you say to them, well, look, guys, it's down to uh, competition, it's globalization. Uh, you either match up or you don't, and that's got to be the way it is. We're in business, we've got to compete, so therefore that has to be the case. It also means that you are in competition too because globalization effectively puts your competitor not just on the same street, not just in the same town, not even in the same continent, in the same world. Fortunately, we're, li we're limited by the same world at the moment. Um, but the, the thing which we tend to ignore is that although that competition is, comp is global, so are the opportunities. This means a very underrated thing. Unless you are going to be a global operator, then you don't honestly stand a chance against your global competitors because your global competitors are already global operators. So you have to embrace globalization. Now, okay, you say I'm a very small company, it's not really fair to make that observation. You know, screw being fair, business isn't about being fair. Governments aren't about being fair, it's about being competitive. It's about surviving. You have to live like that. Now, one of the things that that Arm did, it was formed, there was 12 people in a barn and right from the beginning we anticipated being global. And so our second office was in California and our 13th person was in California. And it really has been a part of the ecology of Arm right from the beginning. And I think in all seriousness, unless you embrace the global opportunity, then you, you cannot succeed. It's not even a national opportunity, it's a global opportunity, because that's what your competition is. Now, doing business in this life cycle um, involves fairly straightforward stuff. I mean, here is a product. It starts from an idea. This is our shower idea this morning. You go through the uh, creation of the first one and qualifying it, then reproducing it. But it also goes all the way through these other things, right the way through to end of life. Because all of these things are part of the life cycle of a product. And all of them represent business opportunities. 
And these are design tools, training, education, ICT conferences, patents, know-how, tool libraries, models. And although you'll find it says tools over here and tools over here, and they're not the same tools in each one of those categories. So every one of these things represents a business opportunity. And, be, and thank goodness for the, the internet and globalization, most of these things can be provided from somewhere else. Another company, for example, can specialize in providing some of these things and it can provide it not just to one company but to another and you can have several companies involved in this area and because they're able to provide their skills, their tools, their methods, their knowledge, their, their equipment into this environment and become specialized at doing it then they can provide them to other people who need it as well and so we start to see the emergence of a matrix so we now have companies who are providing their valuable product to several companies who need to use it when they're developing their electronic systems. Of course, this is sense, you know that. When education, when we're providing training and know-how, is already a matrix activity. You're not necessarily training those people to train them for a specific company. You're training those people and they'll go out to a range of companies. All that's happened as globalization has enabled us to, to take the whole life cycle of business, pull it apart, and use the best suppliers, wherever they are, to supply into it. You've just got to be one of them. So globalization is predominantly about servicing a valued niche in the global life cycles of many products. Just go out there, just find the niche which is valuable, service it, make money out of it. It's easy, really. Now, the Internet of Things is around the corner, and I don't expect you to read this, but if you could read these, this list, you'd find it on here are uh, cameras and uh, other stuff, the sort of consumable items. And what's happening with the Internet of Things is essentially it's everything everywhere. Everything is aware of everything else, and everything is aware of its context. So you kind of got used to it, your iPhone, it knows roughly where you are, it knows which way it's pointing and things like that, but increasingly, you know, your toaster will know where it is, it'll know which way round it is, it knows which bread has been put in it, everything is aware of its context. Now it's, it sounds very great and undoubtedly the Internet of Things is going to be a large volume opportunity around here. But it's also going to be a heavily commoditized opportunity. The, com the thing which is not visible from the Internet of Things is all of the stuff which is going to be behind it, part of that um, uh, embedded electronic systems that we talked about before. This stuff is necessary to make it work. And what's perhaps um, significant to bear in mind is we're still talking about large numbers. And what's more, the margins get bigger as you get closer to the middle. So there's plenty of opportunity inside this sphere, which is difficult for Joe Public in the street to understand, but doesn't make it any less valuable or real as a business opportunity. So I can be making something, I'm sorry, I can't explain to you what it is, but it is part of the infrastructure which is going to enable Internet of Things, and it can turn out into, to be a market which is measurable in the hundreds of millions. It's a technology market, it's a technology product, but it's a real business. So what does ARM do? We've talked about lots of things, let's talk about ARM for a few moments. Um, it's the process of technology that lies at the heart of advanced consumer products. That's a glib statement. From 50 cents to 200 dollars is the chip level. Okay, um, we've shipped 40 billion of these chips. That's more than one for every person on the planet. It's about five actually at the moment. Uh, and we're anticipating reasonable grounds for belief. These are not figures which are produced by us. There is a reference at the bottom which I can't read and you can't read. Um, but it does say that 150 million is somebody else's, 150 billion is somebody else's figures. ARM expects to be getting a large part of that number. Little ARM, UK company, bear that one in mind. Now the concept of ARM is actually very simple. This, I don't expect you to understand, if you are a techie at all, then you'd immediately recognize it as being a bog standard picture of a computer. Um, all the idea was, let's see, instead of having it as a chip, which most people conceive computers as being, let's have it as a component, like a Lego brick model that can be used inside a chip. And you've seen that picture of a chip a few moments ago, it's the Tegra chip. History has shown that we can make it work. It was hard work to make that happen, but we did persist and we did make it happen. 
more and more complex systems. I talked about there being seven processes on this chip. This is a chip, and a, 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 an illustration of a chip which we know a couple of our partners are working on at the moment. This has got ten processes on it already. It's the next generation smaller. We can have ten processes on there. Ten processes, each one of which was bigger in performance power than I had in the entire uh, company that I was working for when I first came out of university. Now that's a staggering amount, and we've got ten of them on here, just like that. What ARM's technology has done, however, is it's enabled people to make products like this, which frankly are just too complicated to make any other way. It's mostly about reuse. It's about being able to reuse software, methodology, IC design, because you can pass most of the design, most of your yesterday's product, into tomorrow's product and only focus on the 5% or 2% even of change that is necessary to differentiate your product from your competitor's product. Now 5 to 10%, or 5 to 2%, still represents hundreds of man years of effort. So you can see how much our technology is actually saving in terms of effort necessary to produce these complex systems. But we're not the only people involved in it. You said that 196 was it suppliers involved in Apple. There's lots of people who are doing similar things. But the major thing that they're contributing is reuse. They're enabling designs to be moved from one generation to the next generation at the minimum, at minimum cost. Now, just to give you some idea that there's more to it than the chip, there is also the software, there's the GPUs, there's the interconnect methods, there's the physical IP, which is the cell libraries which are necessary. There's the partnership. 900 global partners we have now. 800 of which are fee-paying licensees. So they're not only working with us, complementary to us, but they're also paying money to make use of the knowledge and the IP, the components that we supply across that range of things to enable them to uh, participate in this market. So some of these people are EDA companies who are supplying software design tools to, to help people to design the integrated circuits. They, they realize that by partnering with us, their tools will more, in will more readily integrate into the environment, easing the reuse question. It also means that they, they help because their tools will also help with this porting of a design from one generation to the next. So it's an ecosystem and it's a, a huge ecosystem because of those, uh, nine, of those 900 uh, partners we now have millions of developers. Now of course they don't work for ARM but they are working on the same thing and it benefits ARM. So, scale. 1990, born in a barn in Cambridge, 12 engineers, no revenues, no patents, cash from Apple and VLSI, simply because they wanted to use our technology, a spin-out of the BBC Computers in Schools program, roots in the University of Cambridge. 1990 sounds such a long time ago, doesn't it? But it's not far when we consider the 35,000 year history we've talked about before. Um, a dream to become the global standard for the embedded CPUs. We had a vision. I think that's important. You've got to start with a vision because you can achieve something if your vision scales. If your vision is a short-term short thing, you won't. Now we're one of the world. We are the world's leading IP product. We are one of the UK's biggest companies. We're in the, the FTSE 100 with a market capitalization of nearly 13 billion pounds. We have a revenue of uh, 580 million, which is approaching a billion dollars. Next year we'll, threat, we'll push the, the billion. Profit before tax, 40%. R&D, 30% of revenue is spent on R&D. 30%, not 3%, 30%. That's a large percentage, but it's the nature of our business. 25 offices, but only 2,400 people worldwide. Roughly 990 in the UK. 95% of our revenue is foreign, er foreign earnings. Only half a percent of our revenue comes from the UK. That doesn't make us a traitor, it makes us a bloody good exporter, importer, exporter. 75% of the devices connected to the internet today are ARM powered. That's staggering actually. 75%. It means the internet is an ARM tool. I like that thought. Now we're doing, we're doing all right. Share price has gone up 50% this year. 
20% uh, growth this year, pay rises, share options, modest bonuses, I have to put the word modest in because I'm not a banker. Uh, 70 plus vacancies in the UK today. We can't recruit as many people as we need. We want to grow more all the time, we can't. We're limited by the skills of the people, people that are available. So we've got society's challenges, everybody knows about these. You know, urbanisation, health, transport, energy, security, environment, food, water, ageing, sustainability, digital inclusion, economics. Electronic systems are not going to cure any one of those. Society has to provide the cure. But the one thing we do know is that electronic systems will be fundamental to all of those cures. Whatever those cures are, there is no way today that electronic systems cannot be part of any of those cures. ARM is in those electronic systems, you can be in those electronic systems. There's plenty of scope for it, there's lots of things that need doing. Great opportunity. We won't fix the, pro the problems on our own, but we will be part of the problems. So electronic systems are truly the key enabling technologies. If we want to have a key enabling technology, then this is the one to have. These are the activities which need to be supported. Now, what do you want for the next generation? Generally speaking, it's personalised experience. You're not interested in battery life, you want to be connected all the time, you don't want to be aware of the interface, and as far as the display is concerned, you want it to be paper. It's very easy to predict what customers want. It's more all the time, and less, less money. So, conclusion, you'll be pleased to know I am going to an end. Electronic systems permeate our lives today. I think you must have got that message by now visibly and invisibly. They have enabled the improved services and exciting new products in our lives. IT and ICT are part of this, they are not the whole story. And these electronic syst systems are the children of a globalized creative industry. Yes, it is a creative industry. Some of the smartest people I have ever come across are working in this industry. There's an awful lot of ordinary folk too. But there are some very, very creative engineers who are doing things, frankly, that um, ordinary people can't understand because they've not been trained to understand it. It's a bit like uh, Icelandic poetry. Uh, I understand that some of the most beautiful poetry available is in, is, uh, is, is in the Icelandic tongue. It will always be separated from me because I don't understand Icelandic. That doesn't mean to say that I'm in any way defective, and in the same way I can't point a finger at people and say, because you're not trained as an engineer, it's your fault that you don't understand. It's not fault. You're trained and you're good at whatever it is that you do. Engineers are trained at engineering. They have spent a lifetime doing it. They understand it because they're working on it, but it doesn't make it magic. Please remember that. Further miniaturization will take these electronic systems to ubiquity. They really will be no parts of your life where electronic systems are not impacting. Uh, you think about that one, there's plenty of places at the moment where I think I'd rather not have Big Brother watching me, but I think that uh, pressure will get there eventually. They will keep us amused, entertained, healthy, fed and warm. They will enable us to do business and control finance. They will be central to future plans for climate, transport, energy, health, security and urbanisation. We will become totally dependent on them, willingly. They will become unnoticed and there's a serious danger that they might be unvalued. And we have barely scratched the surface of their potential. The UK has a thriving but largely invisible electronic systems business community. And I advise you to look at a website which is also conveniently obscured on this one, which is the esco, escoreport.com. It's a, an activity which is being uh, conducted in the UK to quantify the electronic systems community. And I can tell you now, we're talking about... Eight thousand people employed in it, we're talking about thousand enterprises, we're talking about nearly percent of GDP coming from this community today. An essentially invisible community today. This is not a business that can afford to be ignored and it's not a business which should be ignored because it's a huge opportunity. We must value them and nurture them because ele the electronic systems is an excellent business opportunity and we're already surprisingly good at it as witnessed this uh, conference here today. So at this point, I think I've said enough. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I will be putting this presentation up on SlideShare uh, so you can see the, uh, the other bits and pieces which were obscured uh, on this presentation here today. But that's all for the moment. Thank you very much for listening.